Hey guys, it's Mr. Reem. Hey, I'm just recording a pre-summer college workshop for all of our rising seniors. This is being recorded in the spring of 2020. And the idea and the art audience for this um, video is for all of our current juniors who will become seniors next year. And a few of the things that we're going to be looking at talking about this year and through this presentation that you'll be able to watch on YouTube is all the things that you need to kind of prepare yourself for as you're looking at applying to four-year colleges in particular. We're going to cover some specifics um, throughout the next hour or so, but I just want to let you know, like, we're not going to be going into super in-depth um, areas of anything at this point. So, so the whole point of this conversation is to get you starting to think about some of these items. And in the fall, we'll be having some informational meetings that go into much more depth. Uh, we'll expand on some of these different topics that we'll touch on today. And we'll be able to actually talk a little bit more um, specifically about what that looks like. Um, so if you're not hearing something that you're looking for during today's um, pre-summer webinar, and, and that's really what it is, it's something to help prepare you to, to use the time wisely while you're out for the summer vacation. Um, I usually do this at the end of the year um, in, in June. And there's two reasons why I'm going to be doing this, recording this early, and, and it's not live and in person. I usually have a evening event. Number one is we are in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and so we're changing our format of our meetings. The other piece is I'm also having a baby in June, so um, I will be actually out of the office during the, the month of June um, with a newborn son. And so we're excited about that, but that's just um, two changes that we've had impact this uh, particular meeting that we usually have at the very end of the school year. So it's going to be done in a different format and in a little bit different timing. So hopefully it does give you a little bit extra time to think about these things, um, and we'll just get, jump right in. I do want to mention that while this video is recorded in English, um, it is shared with our um, bilingual services, and if you require uh, translation or would like this information in Spanish, we're not only going to be having this available with our translators to be able to walk through a few of these things and some of these topics with parents who, who maybe need translation into Spanish, but also we work with Mr. Padilla and the GRIP program. And so if you guys are a part of that, we'll also be having um, a, a partner program with that. So here's our agenda for this uh, webinar video. Um, we're going to cover four key areas. And really we'll spend about 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes in, in each of these, kind of breaking them down and going through what they look like. The first is really identifying the overview of the college application process. Again, we are focusing on four-year colleges, and we'll have some other information that comes out about two-year colleges or trade schools. For this purpose of this webinar, we're focusing on the four-year college university system. Um, and so we're going to go over kind of what that looks like, but we're also going to kind of talk a little bit about this idea of something called FIT. FIT is really the, the model of college advising. Um, it's no longer a single dimension. There's multiple dimensions, and it's also recognizing that everyone is unique. So we'll break down a few of the items of FIT. The other piece that we are going to be doing is looking at what the process specifically looks like. How do the application work? What are the different types of applications and deadlines and um, decision types and such? We'll take a little bit of time and talk about some of the generalities of financial aid. How do we pay for college? Uh, we will have a specific uh, four-year college focused workshop like I mentioned in the fall. We'll also have a financial aid workshop that will happen in the fall as well. Financial aid is available for not just four-year colleges but also junior colleges, um, community colleges, trade schools. There's, it's, it's, it's available for almost anybody. Um, and then lastly we're going to talk about summer work. So how do, what, do, what do we suggest you guys do? Um, and, and when I say you, I'm generally speaking to the student. Parents, when I'm when I'm having these meetings, they're really geared towards the student. The student is the person who is the, the captain of this process. They are going to be the ones doing things. If you find yourself doing things, you're doing something wrong. Okay, And so really the student is the one who should be guiding this process. So when I say you, that is who my audience is. Um, when I say parents, that, that's when I'll be addressing you. So just I want you to have that context as we work through this. All right, so those are the four key areas that we're going to spend a little time today um, looking at. So a few assumptions. Like I said, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and there's a lot of unknowns. And those unknowns um, not only impact us now, but I'm assuming that there will be some impacts that are lasting into um, what would be the senior year and potentially beyond. And so we're going to be discussing a few items that 
um, have a lot of variability involved. And so there's a few assumptions that I've listed below that I want you guys to think about. Number one is that life will regain some level of normality. When that happens, we're not sure. If that's by summer, if that's by fall, um, but we will eventually head back into some normal process. Um, like I said, there are going to be some lasting reverberations. Things are going to be coming and going over the course of its, you know, year to years following this. Um, while maybe we have a vaccine or a solution for the um, virus itself, there will be lasting ramifications. This is not only just going to be impacting K-12 education, this is impacting colleges, this is impacting our economy, people's livelihoods. So there's going to be lasting ramifications. Um, and so... I'll talk about a few of those things as we get to them, about what some predictions might be, some things that we're already seeing happen. Um, but just know that there are a lot more unknowns than normal. And even in a normal year, the college process is full of unknowns already. And so it just kind of it compounds it in that there's a lot of unknowns in addition to just what we can kind of normally expect to see. So just as we go through this talk, as well as go through next year, just keep that in mind that there there's some stuff that will come to light as we learn about it. Um, like I said, I don't know everything about this process. I know quite a bit. And if there's anything that does come up while we are navigating this, I will be sure to share it with you as soon as um, I'm able to or have information shared with me on changes or updates regarding applications, colleges, testing, whatever it might be. I do want to always highlight that um, I've taken a lot of time to kind of put together some resources that are available at your fingertips. Our school counseling website is robust. It's also always updated. Um, I try to update it rather frequently um, and change um, the, the resources that are available. One particular place that I would like to highlight, and I'm actually going to tab over to it, so you should be able to see that pop up here. So we see our school counseling um, website. And so right now in this time of remote learning, this digital counseling link is also going to be very helpful. There's some resources there for students of any grade level, not just rising seniors. Um, there's also information about booking appointment. There's also relevant AP exam information, which if you're watching this um, before that May time frame, you might want to just check some of that information out. A couple of things I want to highlight is um, down here, there's also an option where you can actually chat directly with us. This is available for students or parents inside of our office hours. When we're outside of our office hours, this will actually show up as being able to send us a quick email. The other piece um, is up here underneath the counseling support. Counselors work in three domains, our academic, social, emotional, and college and career. And so for today's webinar, the piece that we're going to be looking at is primarily the college and career counseling, so I'm going to point that out. So if you hover over this page, it opens up some different um, resources. The little thing that you see, that you saw on the presentation, which I'll flip back to in a second, is a handbook, college counseling handbook. Okay, and so there's actually two different ones. There's a two-year college and a four-year college counseling handbook. That's a PDF that you can download and have access to. And there's some other resources that you can find on here too. But it also the other thing that a lot of people don't necessarily realize is you can actually click on this link. And when you click on that link, it's going to take you to a page that I'll, I'll put up a screenshot of a little bit later. But there's a few pieces that I want to just call out. So there's senior profiles, which we'll mention. Um, there's different search tools. There's actually a app, um, essentially a Google Doc spreadsheet that students can use as a template to kind of help them almost think of it like a, a scavenger hunt for college information. This, and that's perfect to actually use right now. Um, there's um, a lot of things that you're going to be putting in and finding about data or information. And so having an all-in-one place that you can search and, and identify easily, that's very helpful. This and this is only available to students. It's not available for, for parents. Um, I do that on purpose. Like I said earlier, the audience is mainly the student. The student is the one doing these things. What I have found is when it was available for parents, the parents were the ones kind of putting in things, plugging things in, adding their own thoughts. Parents, this is no offense to you, but you're not going to college. Your kids are going to college. You are an important part of the team, and we'll talk about the team. But the biggest piece I want to have you avoid as a parent is living vicariously through your student. Okay, Allow them to make their own decisions. Yes, you want to be a guide. Um, but it's really when you start influencing it based on what you want or what you want for them, 
without taking into a context what they want and start doing things on their behalf, that's where we get in trouble. And so I've limited some of these things to only student accounts, um, which they can be more than happy to share with you, um, invite you to, to, to see it, okay, and have that collaboration. But really, I want to make sure the student has the main access. So I'm going to flip back over to our presentation. The next thing, and I'll pop back into the browser in just a second to show you a few of these things, is as we talk about fit, um, there's a couple of resources. There are tons of free resources out there in this world of college, and it's something that I encourage you to use many of the resources that are available to you. A couple of things that I've done is put together a few kind of high quality resources I think are very valuable. Um, the, the screenshot you see here, which I'll show you at the, the PDF in a second, and it's this first link that you'll see on the slide, is from CapEx. They're a college website, and um, they created a pretty comprehensive fit kit, is what they called it. And it's a great tool that really helps you. The other resource, which I'll show you when I flip back over, is also something that's very useful right now. Both of these tools are useful before you actually go through the application process when you're narrowing down this idea of what schools really do fit you as a student. Um, the second one is called the qualities that make a college right for you. Okay, and so that's, that's having you as the student determine what are your wants and needs. What are the things that are important to you about this college search process? So let me just give you a quick glance at some of those. Um, so this is that college fit kit, and as you can see, it's about 22 pages, right? But it's really well done, and it is a great place to kind of start jotting down ideas. It's going to talk about how you stand out in different ways. Um, when I when the words stand out, the one thing, the one caveat I will say is like you don't necessarily have to invent something. Okay, those are kind of like big things. Um, you know, it's these are big items. You don't necessarily need to do those, but it's something that, what are the things that you think matter to you and make you who you are, okay? If you have kind of special accolades, awesome, um, but you don't have to like cure cancer or, you know, start a nonprofit or something like that to, to get into college. Um, it's really about thinking critically. But the big piece about this is really just letting you think about you, all right? Gives you timelines. Um, parents, this is actually a good spot for you. What kind of helicopter are you? Generally, helicopters, I think up here in Tahoe, we like the word snowplow, snowplow parents. Okay, And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm deadly afraid that I'm going to become that parent when, when my son sons are going to be this age. And so I always have to think about this myself. But um, be very cautious about how you go through this next year. Um, is it, It's an exciting year for students and parents. It's a nerve-wracking year for students and parents. And there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way to do it. And many of you haven't done it before. Um, the biggest thing is I want you just to think about um, is am I, am I supporting or doing? Am I the coach or am I the player? Okay, this quiz can help you. And if you scroll down, there are little answers down here that describe you. Okay, but I want you to just explore that. The other one is this. It's called Qualities That Make Your What Make a College Right for You. That's about 16 pages. And it talks about some of the pieces it will mention um, in short in the future and kind of like a few things that you should think about and have you rank them. This is a huge resource, especially right now, to determine what stands out about a college for you. Okay. So let me hop over here again. So like I said, there's a few key elements of fit. Um, it's a two-way street, number one. Um, and so one of the biggest things about the change is in the past it's really been a one-way directional approach to kind of finding the right college or quote unquote right college. Um, and that was mainly the, do I fit the requirements of the college, right? But fit really places the higher emphasis on what the student needs and wants, okay? Some of the biggest things, I usually think about it kind of like if you're th thinking about a starting place, think about some of the big umbrella type questions. So the big picture items, so location and size, that's usually one of the biggest first places that people start. For some reason, and I can think of many reasons, um, a lot of students in Tahoe really want to move to the beach. Um, San Diego is probably one of the most common places people are thinking about looking at for college for many of our students. Um, East Coast is also a big one for a lot of our students. Um, it's kind of funny, some students want to get out of the snow, some students really want to stay in some place just like Tahoe. Um, and so really just looking at those, that can help narrow down. There's 35, 3,600 schools for your colleges across the United States alone. We have to start narrowing some of those down to limit our search 
Um, I'll show you a couple tools later as well with Naviance and stuff like that that will help do that digitally. Um, but just in this thought process, location and size are two that we can really narrow quite a few of those out of the picture. Um, another one is the social and environmental interests or concerns. And so that is actually a huge piece of fit. Um, most students, when they go to college, uh, they are not necessarily unhappy. Or the students that come back and say, I, I didn't like it, I, I dropped out, I changed schools, whatever it might be, it's usually not academic, actually. It's usually social or environmental. They didn't like, you know, they thought LA sounded novel until they had to sit in two hours of traffic to drive 10 miles. Um, and so, so it's usually kind of a little bit different. It's a combination, but it's usually more social and environmental than actually academic where people struggle. Um, another way to kind of identify fit and also narrow this list down is looking at uh, academic desires. What are the things that you want to learn? Um, another thing that I hear a lot is this word good. Okay, and I want to be very cautious with the idea of the word good. Good describes, I would say, 99% of colleges out there. Good is very subjective. Different people think about the word good in different ways. And so really what I want you to redefine that is, is right. Okay, Because a good college... I think the most typical thing that people think about when they say the word good is selectivity. And selectivity has no association with the quality of education. Okay, Just because a school admits 5% does not mean that they necessarily educate students better. Um, they are just more picky about who they take. Okay, And many times I would argue counterintuitively that the student that maybe says I want to go to a good college might not be a very good fit at that college. All right, so, so you really want to think about how you fit and what are your needs. So some things to think about academically would be like class sizes. What are their average class sizes? Okay, and always ask, like, what are your freshman class sizes or your introductory level of class sizes? Because those tend to be bigger. Many schools, you might have an average class size of 20, but that's maybe because they're counting all their labs or study groups or their senior level classes uh, in addition to the 400 student intro to psychology class that you might have to get through. Um, also look at graduation rates. One word of warning about that is most graduation rates are typically reported on a five-year to six-year scale. So how many students have graduated within five or six years? Not the standard four-year. And five years is becoming more of the normal. All right, and we'll talk a little about that in financial aid in a second as well, but it's something that you'd have to consider um, is this idea of graduation rate. Um, Pre-professional programs um, is something that also sometimes is confusing. A lot of people maybe that want to enter the law or medicine or things like that think, oh, I'm going to study pre-med. Um, most colleges do not have a formal pre-med program. You're going to study bio, OCHEM. Um, you know, in law, they might have a, a ethics or sociology or something along those lines. But most programs, when you study law or, or business or you know things like that that have a graduate degree requirement, usually don't have a pre a formalized pre-major, um, but they do have these things called pre-professional programs or pre-professional advising programs that help students navigate the process of, say, getting into medical school, and usually those are um, kind of an informal service that students will access, usually in their second or third year of college, um, it, but it's not necessarily something that you will potentially major in all four years or a formalized, maybe even part of your educational process. A good way that I like to think about this idea of fit, and another way to, to kind of give you an example is about a job interview. And I, I often ask students, have you been on a job interview? And a lot of them say yes. Um, but most of their job interviews is, are, can you, sh can you show up on time? Uh, will you not cuss at the customers and be honest with the money? Like, it's, it's pretty typical high school level job interviews. Um, less where maybe a career level interview where you are thinking about investing a large portion of your time and energy and, and mental faculties into a job um, over the course of many years, potentially, um, where there's a lot more thought that goes into potentially that than maybe working at 7-Eleven or um, working at, say, for example, um, being a lifeguard at the pool for the summer. So there, there might be some different pieces that you need to consider about. But generally, most people think about a one directional interview. And that's like I said, where the where you're fitting the needs of the colleges. And that would be the company or the college interviewing you. That's that's them scrutinizing your application, understanding what you can or can't do, what you did well on this three hour exam that you took for one day on a weekend. Um, 
and really do your qualifications meet the needs of this company or the school? Okay, do they like the answers? How competitive are you in the pool? Um, potentially, do they have someone in decision already? Um, there are, you know, kind of unwritten things in college admissions processes that, you know, especially in private schools, less so in public, but even there, um, that favor certain populations or favor donors or legacy or things like that. And so, so there's different avenues that you have to think about, but that's really kind of the piece um, about the company interviewing you. Um, what most people don't think about is this idea of you interviewing the company. And this, again, goes back to this idea of fit. Um, it's really about how does this college meet my needs? Is this something that I feel good about committing the next four to five years of my life and paying $100,000 potentially into as an investment to, to really commit to? Um, can I see myself living in this location, in this environment? Can I see myself being on this campus? Do I understand what their beliefs and philosophies are, how they teach students, what they what they follow, how is the political climate on campus? All those things are going to be things you have to think about. Um, and as a good job interviewer or interviewee, you should also be thinking about those like when you're applying for a job. Do I agree with their philosophies? Do I have room for growth? All those things, just like in a job interview, you have to kind of mirror in this um, world of college applications. So there's a few helpful fit tools that I'll show you, um, and you guys can either pause the video and kind of write a few of these down or come back to it later. Um, but I'm just going to mention them. I'm not going to pull them up. Um, we'll actually open up Naviance um, together later, and I'll highlight a few ways to use that. But there's a few other ones. Big Future is actually from the College Board. It's actually a really good resource. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the College Board. They do some things pretty well, and this is one of them. Um, and so I'll give them props there. But it's a great free tool, and many of your students, if they're taking the SAT or took the PSAT, which most of our students have, um, likely already actually have a College Board account. And so it's something that's easy for them to do. Um, on the bottom left of the screen is the, something called the FISC Guide, F-I-S-K-E. And that's a pretty thick book that usually is published almost every year. Um, and it's actually a really good resource. It does not cover every college that's out there, but it covers quite a few. And something I would encourage you maybe to download and access um, if you are kind of looking to expand your options a little bit more. Um, it's a great opportunity to read some pretty unbiased reviews of colleges where they, they, do, they have a process that they review different campuses and, and provide some detail that maybe you can't find on their website or um, on Naviance or things like that. Um, it's probably 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon, uh, but it might be a good buy. Um, it might be worth 30 bucks to get some more information before you make a $100,000 investment. Um, Rugg's recommendation is very similar, um, but takes a little different avenue about how that works. And that's really a, a look. They look at um, and had some relatively scientific ways of looking at majors. So which schools are a good fit for people pursuing certain majors? And that's something that you can access. It's, it's a purchase, but it, you, know, you don't get a physical book. You get a PDF copy. Um, and then, like I said, Naviance Supermatch is one of the big tools that, in this time frame, kind of helping create this list uh, will will be very helpful. And I'll show you actually how to use that tool um, together in just a few minutes. So like I mentioned, we have a team. And really, that's the idea that we want to take. Um, this is not the student versus everyone else. This is not the parent doing everything for the student. This is not the counselor doing everything for the student. And I'll give you a pretty big hint, I don't do that. Um, I'm very much a strong advocate for students' um, ownership in this process. Um, we are definitely here, just like a coach, to do things together and provide scaffolding and support. Okay, But I really want students to kind of start thinking about who they're identifying as their team for college processes. Um, it's something that we have to think ahead about. Um, and, and not everyone is going to have the same team. Everyone's team is going to look slightly different. Some students, it might be the student and, and me, the school counselor. Some students might be the school counselor, maybe a teacher or two at, at school. Um, I, would, I would venture to guess most teachers would be very willing and happy to help you. Um, some families, uh, it includes the parent or the guardian. Um, other families, maybe not. Uh, maybe for reasons that are outside of your control. Um, or maybe potentially like they, they don't really know too much about the process. They're very supportive and helpful, but they just can't support you in the same way that someone else could because they're not necessarily as informed or um, don't really understand what this very complicated system looks like. Um, 
IEC, what you see up there is called the IEC or Independent Educational Consultant. That would be like a private college counselor. Um, we work with college counselors and it's something that if your family has the means and wants to pursue that, um, it's something that you guys can look at. Um, a college counselor is not a substitution for me. Um, many of the steps in the process require my engagement and so I will still be a part of that team. Um, and, and it's definitely something that um, it's great to have a college counselor who's interested in working collaboratively with us at the school. Um, we can work together very closely and, and, and kind of help support the student as best we can. The student who might want an independent educational consultant would be someone who maybe wants pretty regular and personalized um, check-ins. I have over 300 students on my caseload and so being able to spend an hour or two hours a week every week throughout the fall with your student is probably just not very feasible for me. And so I definitely recognize that. And so if you do want to have that higher level of support, um, it's totally someone that you can reach out to. And while I can't give recommendations, I, I can um, put you in contact with some different resources. Uh, the other piece would be make sure that they are a part of a formalized association like NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. They hold uh, their members to high standards. And so um, it's something that you want to just make sure that you're working with someone who's reputable. Um, and then you as a parent as well. Um, we're all part of this team and it's something that we're really wanting to make sure that every student who walks through this process has the ability to kind of get through with the support that they um, probably will need during this time. So I'll take you through a quick look at the timeline. So what is the timeline of applying to college? All right, and so um, I wrote pseudotypical because everyone's is going to look slightly different. Um, different schools have different windows of application, different deadlines, and things like that, which I'll highlight a few key ones. But um, essentially, to start with at this bottom step, really, it's kind of now, early spring, <coughs> excuse me, early spring through August is really kind of this time frame to plan, research, test. Um, we'll talk about tests, but, and, and think about what this looks like. Like I said, this is a pretty, um, this is definitely a new era with um, the pandemic and, and lots of unknowns, like I mentioned. And so there are some changes about what's gonna be accessible. For example, it's gonna be pretty tough for people to maybe take some um, college tours. I have put a great, actual awesome resource that was recently developed um, a few slides in, um, which I'll call out and point you to when we get there, about how to access, say, virtual visits or, or ways to do bit, essentially virtual college tours. Um, but that's kind of the big pieces right now is this idea of researching. Um, essentially starting around August, right when we get back into school, through around December is when actually most of the art applications are kind of essentially done reviewed and submitted. And so most students over the course of about three months will get all of their applications started and finished. Um, generally, most students and most applications are not even available to start filling out um, prior to you know the start of the fall. Common App, things like that can kind of loosely get started um, and rolled over over the summertime, but nothing can actually get submitted. Um, and usually they'll have a specific starting date and a deadline. November, December is generally the kind of target to finish most or all of your college level testing. That would be like the SAT, the ACT, any subject tests. Um, when we talk about decisions, application types, um, it's something that you want to just keep in mind in that uh, many schools, if you're doing a different decision type or finding this information about your schools, about when they want test results in, could potentially change that. But most CSUs, UCs, for example, um, are expecting to your last sitting could potentially be in November or December. Um, and like I said, with all the changes and, and unknowns going on, there's a lot of changes in particular that we can expect to potentially see in this testing environment. Kind of the second half of the year, um, in the financial aid area, uh, the, F the FAFSA is typically scheduled to open every October 1st, and this is a yearly process. The FAFSA is done every single year that a student is in school. And so um, every October 1st, it should really go on your calendar to start the FAFSA. And Mar I put March on there. March 2nd is technically the deadline, and that's a California priority deadline. Different states, if you're applying out of state, have different deadlines. Um, many of them, and, and even in California, the suggestion is as soon as possible. There are pools of financial aid that disappear over time. Um, December through May is really uh, when most of our senior level scholarships are available. Most students only receive scholarships locally. There are national and regional level scholarships that students can definitely apply 
too um, to get money, but it's something that you have to kind of understand your time and, and investment there to see if it's going to be worth it. The likelihood of getting those scholarships, and, and we will go more into that into our financial aid award or our financial aid informational session in the fall, but um, usually those scholarships that students end up actually receiving um, open up usually right after those the, the fall applications close. And so it's kind of a nice little time frame. Um, and then kind of towards the end of that is really May 1st. May 1st is what they call the National, National College Decision Day. And that's the deadline to submit something called your SIR, or your Statement of Intent to Register. And that's kind of your agreement that you'll be attending. You'll be doing that to one school. Um, and also you'll be placing a monetary deposit. So that's going to be something that will be required to hold your spot. The SIR is typically done electronically. Um, and in the process, you'll get access to something called a portal for your school where you'll, it's kind of like Aries for college. And so you'll be doing that and you'll probably pay a deposit electronically as well. So just be prepared. Um, and the deposits range anywhere from, you know, $100 to $500 typically, um, but they could really kind of vary pretty broadly. Um, you'll generally, you, wish, you, you should only be placing one deposit. And so you don't need like $5,000 in the bank necessarily because um, you won't be placing deposits at every school that you apply to. So what does their application list actually look like? And so I kind of broke it down into three different categories. The far left one um, is something I, and the words, I put them in quotes because the words are, are interchangeable. Different people will use different words and there's no real true word that I really like. Um, but I tried to do my best to, to kind of give you a couple different options. The far left is gonna be kind of expected or likely. Okay, and so again, this is, this is you kind of looking at um, at it from how will they look at my information? So how likely am I to, to meet their expectations of, of a student who is generally admitted? Okay, so this does kind of take a little bit of the your interests out of the equations, but I'll bring that back in, in a minute. Um, this is really going to be like schools that maybe you exceed the expected or average requirements, say, for example, in GPA or the SAT scores. And you're going to want anywhere between one and three. You kind of want, we, we, a lot of people might call this the safety school. I hate the word safety because nothing is safe in the college process. Everything has some risk. Um, but you can definitely make some good, better assumptions, um, meaning if you are well above the typically admitted student, you are probably more safe um, than maybe someone who wasn't above the average admitted student. And so that's why I use expected or likely. And, and one to three is typical. Um, these numbers that we'll go through are, are just a suggestion. Um, I would say most students applying to four-year colleges probably should have no less than four or five applications. Anything less than that, and you start limiting not only your options for admissions, but also your options for financial aid, your decisions at the end of the game. Okay, People change their minds. Uh, what was maybe your first choice in the start of the process may becomes your last or no longer interested choice at the end of the process. All right, so that's one to three expected to likely. The middle one is kind of the meet or fit, and this is where most of your colleges should hy hypothetically fit, okay? When you're finding your, your data on the different schools, so like um, a lot of schools will report what's called percentiles. So they'll report the 25th, the 50th, and the 70th fifth percentile. And you can kind of see where you fall in those percentiles. All right, so the higher up the percentile list you are, kind of the, the maybe better fit you are for that school. Um, kind of the mid-50 is where we usually use the target range. Um, if you're above that mid-50 percentile, usually you're probably on a more likely side of the scale. If you're below that mid-50, you're usually on the more reach end of the scale. The far right um, is, so that's three to five meter fit schools. That's kind of where that chunk, like I said, should be. The far right has about another one to three schools in this reach. You do not have to apply to reach schools. I want to be clear to that. Um, they're just in there because you shouldn't have all reach schools. When you're doing all, if you did all reach schools, all schools would say seven to five percent, five to seven percent, not seventy-five percent, five to seven percent admissions rates. What you are doing is you're playing statistics against you. Okay, um, and so we want this to have a very broad and diverse application list. Um, if you think of it like investing, you don't want all of your eggs in one basket because if something goes south, that's going to be all of your savings. Okay, the same thing here. You don't want to put all your eggs into a highly selective school. Um, and that's typically the, the, the wording that you'll see sometimes is this highly selective or very highly selective schools. Um, but this essentially where your qualifications might be below 
the average. These might be a harder school for you get in, to get into. You can apply to one to three there or, or shift so, some of those numbers into some of the other categories as well. Um, so either end of the spectrum is something that you just want to be a little careful about. Okay, Sometimes students with a lot of expected or likely schools, they might actually be doing what's called undermatching. They are kind of purposefully bringing their um, program down or their, their options down so that they get into more schools where they're not necessarily challenging themselves quite as much. Um, the thing that I want to point out down below, and I wrote first choice underneath each of them, and this is where kind of I said would come back in this idea of um, fit. Every one of these schools that's on your list should hypothetically be a first choice school, meaning if you got into only one school that was on your list, Okay, you should be on some level happy to go there. All right, clearly you'll probably have a hierarchy of which ones are more preferred or not. All right, but it kind of frustrates me when I see students that, um, well, I why are you applying to that school? Uh, my parents told me to, or I know I can get in. Do you actually want to go there? And they say no. So, so why do you apply? Okay, so I want you to think about that um, as as a very important thing that you look into. Um, every school needs to be a first choice school. So some of the different application types that you're going to see, um, and I've listed a few, and I'll highlight um, with my words a few of the most common ones, um, but I've included them all, um, at least uh, the, the vast, vastly used ones. So by and far, um, most of our students use um, primarily three application types. The first one is... Um, the common application. And so what that one is, is um, that's a common app. When I say common application, that's big C, big A. Um, it's a formal organization. There's about 900 colleges. Most of them are private or out of state that use this application. It's a great tool. If you have more than one school that's on this application, I would probably suggest using this application because it'll save you a lot of time. Um, it, it, kind of reduces the amount of work that you need to do uh, when possible. So that's called the Common App. It's at commonapp.org. That's something that you can start exploring now if you wanted to, um, to see what's down there and, and looking up schools. The next one is really the school-specific or school-specific universal application. Um, and so what that's going to be um, is, for example, the UC or the CSU system. They also use a "Quote unquote common application, little c, little a, not a formal organization. It's a common app in that, in the sense that you can apply to all of the UCs using one application, and you can apply to all of the CSUs using another separate but single application that will apply to all the schools in that system. Um, and so both those schools use a common application as well, and those three are probably the most commonly used tools that students will need. Um, it is something that uh, as students go through, every year looks different in terms of what their college application makeup looks like. Um, the other one that's kind of underneath there, at the very bottom, is, is an application called the Coalition App. The Coalition App is um, it's an application that is growing, but it's um, I don't like it. It's not a very good application, in my opinion, and that's why I wrote Avoid If Possible. It's generally looked at as an, as an optional application. There are a few schools out there that do require this and this is the only option to apply. For example, um, University of Maryland is one of them. University of Washington up in Seattle is another one. Um, if you have to use it, use it, but just be aware and you need to make sure you communicate that with me. Um, it's, a, it's a somewhat cumbersome and not very clear application. They have great ideas behind it, but they're, they're kind of application of their ideas is pretty poor. So if you have an option other to use something other than the coalition app, like the common application, um, I would highly suggest doing that. So along with kind of the application systems, there are generally certain types of admissions offered as well. I'm going to highlight a few of these. The few of them I'll let you read on your own. But um, the primary mode of application for almost all students, and, and it's going to be the default mode for almost every application is something called regular decision. So regular decision is kind of the typical way that we think of um, students applying to college where a, a school will open up an application for a period of time. Um, they'll have a deadline to submit their application by a certain date 
and then close the applications, review all their applications, and then have a notification date in the spring. Um, everyone gets reviewed all at once, and that's kind of the process. So that's, that's regular decision. That's what most students and many students will likely do. There's another system called rolling admissions. Rolling admissions is, uh, for example, like Montana State uses rolling admissions. UNR uses rolling admissions. And what rolling admissions does is um, you'll see it more typically at schools that do not have nearly the volume of applicants. Um, doesn't mean volume, again, like selectivity, volume does not indicate a good or a bad school, um, a school with higher qualifications or less. Just means that it has less students who apply. Maybe they aren't as competitive with their space, um, for example. And so rolling admissions means they usually have an opening date, oftentimes like a priority filing date. So they'll say, hey, if you apply by this date, you might be considered more favorably or you could have qual you know, advanced, you know, say, uh, access to scholarships. Um, but they'll typically rev review applications almost immediately as they come in. So it's not uncommon, like at Montana State, if a student had submitted an application um, to hear back in almost two weeks or less. Um, so there's not kind of this massive notification date with the rolling admissions school. Early action is not a binding, and I'll, that'll become important in a minute. None of these applications so far have been binding. Um, they also, none of them have, and including this one, have um, what we would call admissions benefits to them either. And so that's something that is, is pretty important to know as well. Um, but early action basically means um, students have the opportunity in, in this application type to basically submit an application early. And so they can prepare themselves early and submit it at, by an earlier deadline than say a regular decision um, deadline. And the, the admissions committee can get to work on it sooner, which means they oftentimes get notified sooner about their admissions or not admissions. And so that's really the main benefit is for the student knowing their admissions results. Um, on the right side, there's actually two restrictive application plans. The left is all non-restrictive, meaning non-binding. And generally you're not, um, restricted from applying, you could apply everywhere rolling admissions if that was option, an option, everywhere early action if that was available. Okay, On the right side of that black line on the screen is restrictive application plans. And what that means, the most common one you'll see is ED or early decision. Okay, um, Early decision kind of is similar to early action in the sense that students will be making an earlier application. They will submit, submit their application by an earlier deadline. The main difference is going to be twofold. Number one is they are signing and, and you as a parent, well, you as a student, the parent, and myself actually, are signing a legal contract saying, I'm signing that I've informed you, you're signing a legal contract. You as the family are signing a legal contract um, saying that if I'm admitted, there's a couple things that'll happen. Number one is that I will immediately place a deposit and sign my intent to register. Number two, I will cancel all other college applications. So if I haven't heard from three other schools and I literally wanted to hear from, you're, you're bound to then go and cancel your applications because you have committed to that early decision school. Um, and you are required to attend. Okay, And so generally, there are some, some last ditch efforts to get out of this. If, for example, the financial aid offer comes back wildly different than what kind of the predictors have said. Um, but if it's like, you know, it's $200 different, I can't go. Like they're not gonna probably let you out of that. Um, but they they do have this binding contract that you'll be signing. This type, the restrictive early action is essentially very similar. Um, with the, the difference being that they can have typically until that May 1st national decision day versus needing to place deposit immediately. Um, the early decision does come with the admissions benefit though. So, so we're not gonna go into it this webinar, I'll show you um, how that works in our fall session, but the early decision, schools are looking for people they are for sure bets, so they want people for sure in roles um, at their school, and early decision is one way that they, and one tool that they use to get those. They know how many students are going to be coming, because when they send out a regular decision, they don't know who's going to say yes or who's going to go to a different school or say no, and so they're trying to fill a class. And so that's where the ad admissions benefit potentially comes in. This will not take you from likely an admit to a deny or deny to admit, um, but it might put you above someone else that maybe wasn't early decision if you guys were in a similar spot and they can only pick one of you. 
And so that's the biggest piece. Um, there's a lot of caution that I would exercise with early decision. Very, very few students, in my opinion, should be applying early decision. Um, it takes a lot of thought and probably many conversations. This is not something that you do lightly. It's also the own, like these two on the right-hand side, why they're called restrictive, is you're only able to do them at one school. Okay, so you cannot apply early decision anywhere else. Okay, you can do one school early decision or one school REA, restrictive early action, and then choose any of the other options on the left of that bar. Okay, but you can only do one from the right. Um, so it's got to really truly be your first choice school in every single way. So here's a couple of key application tips for students. Okay, number one is do review. Um, too often I see mistakes on applications in simple, kind of dumb ways, to be honest. They're, they're too easy to, to make a mistake on. Okay, remember this is your one opportunity. There's no take backs. As soon as you hit submit, that application is gone. They're not gonna reopen it for you. They're not gonna make changes if you misspelled your name or made an error, okay? Um, Make sure that you're asking people to review your essays, review your application with advance notice. All right. One thing and one note that I will put in there, this is for students and parents primarily, but students, I before you ask anyone else to look at your written responses, complete a first draft. Okay. Too often when you ask people about their opinions of what you should write too early in the process, those responses become their responses and not yours. So it's very important to make these responses you. They don't care what your, no offense parents, again, they don't care what your parents think. They care what you think. You're going to school. They want to know who you are and who they are admitting. Okay, so I want you to make sure that your voice is the one coming through. You can definitely take and receive feedback on that. Okay, but I do not want the content necessarily to change. Just more of your delivery and, and really kind of the approach is really what we can finesse. The second one is deadlines. Deadlines matter. Okay, very different than high school. High school deadlines are kind of like these fluffy deadlines that, yeah, you know, we'll still take it. That does not exist in college. You are going to be, um, ask anyone who's left for college how, what happens if they turn in their paper late. Um, it doesn't get turned in. That's the answer. Okay, and so ultimately you're going to be in, a, in, a, uh, in for a world of change when you graduate high school in that regard. And so start getting used to that now. We've tried to make some of these deadlines a little more strict as we've gotten older. Okay, but they're real. All right, and you, meaning the student, has to know and abide by them. There's no do-overs, like I said. If it says 11:59 p.m. PST, and you know you're in, you know Thailand or something like that, and you don't turn it in by that time, you don't turn it in. Okay. There's also things that are un uh, unpredictable, like for example, servers going down, or in the past we've had issues where. Um, a school on the East Coast, their server and their deadline is set to East Coast time versus West Coast time. So it might say 11.30 p.m. and they usually put the time zone, but sometimes they don't. Um, so do you want to make sure that you ask if you have questions, that you plan ahead, and that best case scenario, you just be ready to submit early. Um, give yourself two or three days to have an issue with the technology if your computer dies or all of a sudden the application clears itself. Give yourself two or three days to make sure that that's ready to go. The third one is honesty. Okay, being honest, hopefully this is self-explanatory, but being honest in all the applications, including your FAFSA. Okay, the FAFSA is a self-reported thing. Okay, but they do what's called verification, which we won't go through again in this webinar, but we will talk more specifically about in our financial aid session, which is essentially like an audit. Okay, and they select about a third of all students for, for a verification process. And so if it shows something different, you might find yourself in some hot water. Okay, it's not just about completely lying though, but it's also about exaggerating your accomplishments or like embellishing your contributions or otherwise falsifying information. And this is something that you not only have to do on your applications, but for example, um, for letters of recommendation, which we're not necessarily gonna speak on at this meeting, um, but when you when you ask for a recommendation from like myself or teachers, we're going to ask you for a senior profile. Okay, and that's kind of like your brag sheet. And it, it's it, it's not common that I would check things, but sometimes I, I know something or I read something and it sounds very counter personality to you um, as the student. I've called a few times, and there's been a few times that I found that that information was not actually true, and I've told them I'm not writing a letter for that person. Okay, I can't trust that person's word and I would not be doing a college service of recommending them. Okay, so please just be honest with your information. They won't likely go back and double check you, but they very well could.
All right, then the last thing is pay attention. All right, and this is important, and hopefully we're getting a lot of good practice with this right now on our digital days, but um, paying attention, that means checking your email and checking it regularly. Before you start this process, I would highly suggest if you don't have one, create a personal but professional email address. Okay, usually a name is great. Okay, so create one with your first and last name. Um, and use that for all of your college process. All right. Um, I do not suggest using your school email address for anything that's college related, including FAFSA or financial aid or scholarships. The main reason is because our school email, you will lose access to your school email one year after you graduate. All right. And so many of these processes will be continuing for four or five or many years beyond when you graduate. And so you want to have access to all these different pieces of information. Once you've also applied, you're also going to need to check your portals. Um, they have checklists and admissions websites where they um, they are not necessarily going to be emailing you and pestering you to turn in things or submit things. Many times you'll have a portal, it'll have an, a checklist of what they need from you, and it's your job to check it and make sure that it gets cleared. Okay, If it's not, then they just don't process your application. Okay, So please be sure to seek out the information that you need. So let's talk a little bit about testing. Okay, So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one, but um, there are some probably concerns about this. Um, so really what, when, why, and how of testing. So most four-year universities are going to require some level of achievement testing. Um, this year in particular, both for our current seniors as well, and, and actually probably more impacted is our class that we're speaking to right now, our, our rising seniors, the class of 2021, um, because we've had two SAT and ACT windows essentially canceled. So the, the March and the May exams have been um, canceled. And so those are pretty big windows when students in junior year will take or start taking SATs or ACTs. Many of these universities will be requiring them. Um, some schools and some school systems have come out that they will become what's called test optional. And some schools have already been like that for many years. Test optional means that students can submit test scores for consideration, but you do not have to for admissions consideration. Um, there might be some other ways that you need to show your skills or demonstrate your abilities um, other than, a, than a, like a SAT or ACT score, and that will be determined by each individual school. Um, but that's going to be something that I would anticipate potentially seeing more of over the next year to two years. And so you might see more schools going to something called test optional. Okay, But I would definitely encourage, I don't think every school will. Um, unless this continues for a very long time. Um, but if there's some opportunities to test um, in June or in, over the summertime, usually in most typical years, June, and then a test setting in August is, is kind of our two next windows. There might There's some talk about College Board or ACT offering maybe a July exam as well. So just pay attention to that. We'll try to, that's one of those things that I'll try to keep you updated on. Um, the tests are considered interchangeable. So you really want to take the one you're most prepared for. Most students at our school take the SAT. Um, most of our curriculum is based in College Board type of content. So AP is all the same organization we give the PSAT, for example. So, so most students will take the SAT. The ACT is another option students can do. If you're taking it early on, um, trying both is not a bad idea. Um, like I said, most schools need the last test setting to be like in November, December, but you want to make sure that you're checking on that and not just assuming that is the case. So why the heck do we do these tests and why can't they just go away? That would be the magic answer that I wish I could get an answer to as well. Nobody, believe it or not, in most college admissions processes actually likes the exams. Um, they're just kind of a, a nature of the beast. But the main reason why schools haven't ditched them completely um, is that there's something called a standardized normed referenced exam. Okay, and so what that means, standardized means that they are essentially the same. Okay, so, so you can compare them like for like. Normed means that you can also compare them sitting to sitting. Okay, and reference means that everyone has an idea of what certain score means. And so that is the big thing. So most of the things in the admissions process, essays, GPAs, test um, grades, uh, reference or uh, recommendations, that kind of stuff, are, are terribly hard to compare from someone in Nevada to someone in Washington to someone in Virginia. Okay, um, these SATs or ACT scores are one thing that we can compare no matter what school you attend. So it gives us a baseline and a target. On this slide, I've also posted the class of 2019 SAT data. So over 2.2 million students took an SAT 
um, in that class, which is quite a few. So that's, that's a lot of students. And the average of all those students, the average test score out of 1600 was a 1059. It usually fluctuates anywhere between about a 1050 and a 1070 on, you know, year over year. Um, you know, most schools that you'll see applying, uh, that you might be applying to, will show likely an average freshman SAT score. Sometimes they'll break it down by section, sometimes they'll just have the overall. Okay, that's going to be your target. But that's the national average um, out of all 2.2 million students who take this exam. You do have a couple tools. Number one is the Navvance Test Prep. Okay, so that's going to be for ACT prep. So this little GIF that you'll see on, or GIF, I guess, um, that you see on the screen. Once students log in in Naviance, which I will um, try to show you, but the, the hard part is, is that I can't actually see that on my demo account, so that's why this is on here, but I'll show you kind of where it lives on our, on our site. Um, that's a great tool. It's prescriptive learning for the ACT. The Khan Academy has great SAT prep. Um, those two online free resources are actually very, very good, and most students, I would say, can do that and be perfectly fine. Um, there are other organizations out there that will provide test prep that you can pay for, um, but these are both free opportunities that students can have access to. So let's talk a little bit about financial aid now. Um, so here's kind of the average, and, and I show this to you first, but I don't want to show it to you to scare you, and we will break this down, like I said, more in our financial aid um, programming. But essentially, if we were to add up all these numbers, so public in-state is on that number on the left, so $10,000. Public out-of-state is 22, um, and 36 for private out of It doesn't matter if it typically it's in-state or out-of-state. Overall, uh, averaging those numbers, it's about $23,000 a year um, in tuition costs. So tuition um, generally does not include room and board. And that's something important to know. So, for example, like the public in-state, the tuition would be $10,000. Room and board, very typically, is about $10,000 as well. So that brings up that cost about twenty grand. So um, I do want to make sure that you know that those numbers are excluding the room and board. Room and board does change based on what the school is and, and a few other factors. So that they didn't include that. Um, on the slide, the biggest thing I actually want to point out, though, is that while that number is staggering from probably most people, um, College is definitely expensive, there's no denying that, but it's also an investment. It's something that if we're gonna pay a large amount or even take loans out to help pay for a large amount of funds, but ultimately the cost of doing so, if you do it wisely, um, easily pays for itself year over year over year. All right, and so in the media, there's a lot of shock and awe, there's a lot of, um, things that are thrown out about students leaving school with $200,000 and how uh, in debt and, and how it's not a valuable experience. And so students who do this well and, and really prepare themselves well and understand what they're getting themselves into can go to school, get a great degree, um, get a job that will pay for itself and the student loan payments if that's required, um, which, which is, is a good investment. All right, it's the students that don't do it well. Okay, if you're going to enter a profession that the starting salary is $36,000 and you go to a school that overall costs $50,000 a year and you don't qualify for any financial aid, that's going to leave you with $200,000 in loans. That's going to be a struggle. It might not be the best choice. That's, going to, that's an individual family decision that you have to think about is what are these things. So there's a few things to keep in mind as we talk about financial aid and just to think about it is number one, being realistic. Okay. So, so college is likely going to happen, okay? And so when we buy a house or buy a car, if I can't afford a Ferrari, I'm probably not going to go shopping at the Ferrari dealership, okay? And so you need to shop where it's appropriate for you. And so understanding what your family's level of commitment financially per year is going to be, remembering that this oftentimes lasts four to five years. Um, using Naviance as well as there's a tool on the FAFSA Forecaster is what it's called. It's on the FAFSA website. Um, provides estimates of, of what it looks like. Many schools will have an average cost of attendance calculator that you can look up that will give an average amount that you might be on the hook for. There are outside scholarships, which we won't talk about um, specifically here, but like I said, most of uh, our students get the, the regional or local scholarships. The national ones, kick a field goal, win a million bucks, aren't usually marketing tools that you, you won't win money typically, but you will win a bunch of junk mail. Um, ask questions, 
Okay, I put a few examples there. Deadlines are important. This is super important. Um, number one is file taxes. Okay, taxes are, are required to be able to file the FAFSA. Um, and that's two years prior taxes. And so that would be 2019 taxes uh, for the first year of freshman um, of college. And so um, make sure that you're also paying attention to the multiple year investment that you're required to make. Okay, the financial aid offers as well as the costs are all given on a year basis, not a four, four year, this is the total investment. So you need to make sure that you're multiplying things by four because you might look at it and be like, yeah, we can make that work. It'll be tight, but we'll make it work and then you know we'll go from there. You have to make sure that you can make it work over the four years. And financial aid does change based on your income. If your income fluctuates really highly, um, pay attention to that. If you're on more of a stable income, usually you can expect roughly the same financial aid package year over year in general. Uh, and also to apply. A lot of people kind of, sometimes don't think they'll qualify for scholarships or qualify for the FAFSA. And your income might not qualify you for something called need-based aid. Many times that FAFSA or the numbers or information comes from the FAFSA is required for something called merit-based aid. And so you'd be throwing away free money. So it's, it's my strongest opinion that 100% of all seniors should fill out the FAFSA or the California Dream Act, which we'll cover later. All right, so we're moving into number four, the summer work, and we're almost done. All right, the summer work, okay. One thing to remember, this is a summer like no summer before. We've never had this going into school. We've had quite a disruption already, and who knows when it will be done with regards to kind of being on digital learning. Um, like I said, ramifications are unknown. There's a lot of changes, a lot of unpredictable areas. So what are some of our opportunities? So like I said, study for the SAT, ACT prep, okay, those different tools that I showed you, okay. If you travel, at some point, if travel kind of limitations are lifted, um, make sure um, that you think about your visits, okay, and, and really think about how can I get the most amount of information. A tour is definitely great. Um, if you're already traveling somewhere, look at schools in the area. All right, at the very bottom of this slide, there's a link. Um, you can type that in. That is a very comprehensive virtual college visit list. College visits have been very challenging since our travel limitations. So there are a lot of schools that have invested and put time and energy into doing a virtual college visit. That list is very, very long, and it's very awesome. I would highly encourage you to check it out. Even if you are going on tours, you probably can't visit all your schools. So check out that list. Um, do work, intern, as much as you can um, in the summer because it's going to be those are valuable experiences. Um, your work and volunteer experiences are, are not something that, you know, like I said, you don't have to solve cancer. You could work um, at the shave ice stand. Spend time researching. Okay, find out what you will need. And so, will you have to write essays? Will you need letters of recommendation? Start brainstorming who? Start brainstorming how you might answer those questions. Remember, when you're writing essays, they're going. The, the first default answer for most students is what and not why. And that's opposite of what they actually want. They actually want to hear the why and not the what. All right. And then senior profiles are available. Um, you can use the same one that's on the website that I showed you earlier. Um, and that's something that's kind of a brag sheet. Okay. You do not have to duplicate the stuff that's already on your resume. It's not a extra piece of work, but it is very helpful and required for many of us that write letters. So we're going to hop on to Naviance real quick. And I'm going to show you this free college and career readiness tool. Um, in particular, um, how to find Supermatch and use that, as well as how to find some specific college stats that show pretty detailed information. So let me tab over to that, and I'm hoping I don't have to refresh it. Um, and that it maybe didn't time me out, so we'll test it and see if I do. Just give me a second. So this is when students log in. And the easiest way for students to log in is when you get to the website, um, the North Hill High School Counseling website, click on the Naviance button. And the, the new kind of way to do it is there's an option called sign in with Clever. That's a tool that we use at school. And, and you'll click the button and you'll sign in with your Google account if it's not already signed in. And that's the easiest way. There's not an extra password or login to remember. The Supermatch College Search, you can actually type any school in here and it'll go straight there. But to help kind of explore and really get there, you're going to type, hit the colleges link. And then you're going to click find your fit. 
And there's a whole bunch of other cool resources I encourage you to explore, but the super match is here. So it's going to take a second to open. And so I'm going to clear this out. So I'm going to start over. Okay, so if you wanted to kind of do a whole new search, that's the button you can click. And it's going to ask you to start setting criteria. These are the different criteria at the top. Okay, so you can select this. And it's going to start with location. All right, and so if we said, I want to go to the northeast. Okay, maybe I'm interested in the northeast. You can do that. You can also, like, identify what type of location. So if you're like, I want the northeast, but I want to be somewhere rural, you can pick that. Okay, and then you can come back up here. And you can just hit the next button, and it'll take you to academics. Okay, it's going to say, what type of degree are you looking for? Likely a bachelor's first. I would start there. If you start adding other things, you might not even if that's where you want to get. Majors. Be careful with starting out with majors. Many schools call things different names. As you can see, accounting has all of these different pieces. Okay, So just be cautious. Sometimes I would even skip this initially. You can go back into this later after you get an idea of some schools that fit to find out from that initial list which schools have particular majors. Okay. Um, you can go anywhere from admissions. This is a helpful one too. It shows both admissions rate you can enter SAT scores, GPA scales. Um, you can also enter scores that you think you might want to reach for. Uh, different things like diversity. Again, how you know what's the ratio of male to female, characteristics of the school. So there's a lot of different things that you can actually do. Be careful also not to put too many. All right, too many of these things will limit your list to nothing. All right, so you want to kind of make sure that you are um, picking a few of the important ones, and then you can go back and do a whole nother search and pick a new set. This here is also kind of a nice thing to do. Anything in this box is going to filter any school that does not have, is not in the Northeast. If you're like, I want to go to the Northeast and I'll major in anything, I kind of like rule, but I don't necessarily think I need it. You can click the arrow and it's going to move over here and it's going to rank it higher if it's rural, but if it was like suburban, it would still show up on the list. All right, and so that's going to show you. You can see you've got about 49 institutions that have a FIT score of 90 or above. It's a pretty good choice. So you can kind of go through and see some of these different schools. And then you can see why. So it shows you what it matched or didn't match you on. <coughs> It'll give your average GPA. It's not showing on my demo account because it's not entered. Or SAT scores as well as their averages. All right. It's going to give you some other information that you might need. Okay, And you can also kind of pick over here what items you'd like it to show. Okay, so if you wanted to do diversity, it can show that. If you wanted to change this from cost to athletics, you can do that as well. Okay, so that is the Supermatch search. If you wanted to compare schools, you can see like, I want to do that one. I want to do that one. I like those. And that just puts it all at the top so you can actually see them kind of on top of each other. And then if you're like, hey, I actually do like Unity College. Okay, I'm going to save that to my list for later. What that does is that adds it to the colleges that you favorited, which live here in the colleges I'm thinking about. Okay, so let's imagine that we wanted to get some more information. I'm going to go to a school that I'm a little bit more familiar with. So I'm going to start over. You can click them here, but another nice way is you can just do it from the home page itself. I click back to the home page. If I said I wanted to go to, I want to look up Sacramento State. I can type in SAC, okay, and it's going to give anything with that, so if you want to type in like, so it's going to be California State University, Sacramento, all right, so if I wanted to see specific information about SAC State, I would click that link, it's going to open up a new window, and it's going to lead me to their homepage, all right, some schools have a few pictures up here, videos, all right, and it's going to give you average net price, so you can adjust your cost here. So it's going to say net means how much you're going to pay after eight potentially. Um, what the graduation rate is, and again within six years. All right. So just understanding a little bit more about that. What their acceptance rate is, and then how many college overlaps. So students who also applied or had this school on their application list, where else did they apply? Sometimes that's nice to look at because what you can do is you can find some similar themes among schools. So if you're like, hey, what? Who else? that like Sac State, what other schools do they like? That's a great tool to look at there. Each of these little things up here though has lists of what majors they have. You can filter it by level. Okay, the top areas of study. Student life breaks down ethnicity, gender, okay, different how far it is from home. 
total amount of students that they have. Admissions talks about the cost, acceptance rate. Okay, and this is kind of pretty important information. All right, and on your account as a student, you'll probably also see something called a scattergram, which I can't see on this page. I wish I could show you, um, but I'll see if I can pull it up. This shows our North Tahoe High School students. So you'll see on many other, other resources, the, the tools will show national statistics, how many students overall. This shows our students. So it'll show how many students that were applicants, how many students were accepted, and then how many students en enrolled, for example. Okay, and so we can actually go back and see over time how many of our students are actually getting in. And the scattergram will show you also kind of like who got in and what their GPA score and what their test score was anonymously, so we can't see who got in, but how many students. So that's the two areas of Naviance that I wanted to show you. So let me hop back over here. Just to highlight a few other things, that website I showed you about the college resources, um, down there at the bottom you can also see that link for the senior profile. There's also a few other guides as well as search tools that I've posted on there. This is a sample of that spreadsheet that I talked about where students can type in all the information that they're looking at um, to have it in one spot. And it kind of goes from left to right as students get through the process and, and kind of take their application further from kind of just researching to have I submitted my final transcripts and things like that. This is also helpful for your UC, um, your UC bound students. Um, they have personal insight questions. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on the screen or not, but um, personal insight questions are their short answer response questions or essays. Okay, and you'll have to write um, four out of eight choices. And they provide some pretty detailed information on this page and like this need more help. They have some writing tips and worksheets. If someone is asking you to write something and they offer you tips, you probably should take it. So you can access that and more information on this website up above. The Common App also has some tips and tricks, so you can access that via commonapp.org slash ready. Okay, and that's great if you are trying to organize something. It just has a lot of tools to understand what the process looks like with their application. There's a few more helpful links, and I'll post a PDF of this presentation so you'll be able to type these in. Um, you don't need to necessarily write them all down, but you could take a screenshot or snap a photo if you wanted to pause it and just capture these links here. So finally, and in conclusion, I want to thank you guys for, for watching this. I know it's a long-winded presentation, but I think it's all pretty important stuff. Um, like I said, we've, we're scratching the surface, and we'll go into a few more details with each of these different areas um, over the next six to eight months as we get into um, the end of junior year and go into senior year. Um, like I said, thank you for being flexible and understanding. Um, like I said, I, I usually do this in the end of June but we've moved it up in an, into a different format, so I wanted to make sure that you understand um, that you have this information. You actually have a little bit more time than normal to actually get started, so that's actually probably a side benefit. Um, but I also realized that not doing this in person doesn't give you opportunities to ask questions or, or directly get um, feedback based on the information we covered. And so there's a couple things that I wanted to just point out. If you did have questions, please feel free to leave a comment on the video, so I'm, I'll be monitoring and get notified when you when any comments come in. So if you have a question, and the benefit of doing that would be that many maybe other parents maybe ha or students have a question very similar to yours, and so I can answer that directly on um, the YouTube video itself um, in the comments section. If you think you have a more personal question or don't feel comfortable doing that, I mean, you can also shoot me a quick email. Um, just make sure you use a specific question. Um, it's really hard to to answer. Um, generic questions because there's so much information. So if you have something very specific, please make sure that you specify what the question might be about or as do, do the best you can to kind of ask that um, at a detailed level. You can also feel free to set up an appointment um, with me online, the link's below. If we haven't had your junior ILP or individual learning plan meeting, um, we don't talk as much as we used to about kind of specifics of college. Um, but I'm happy to answer some questions during that time too. So if you wanted to do that or haven't done that, that's also available. There's also other meeting types. And for the time being, those meetings are being held online, either via, via uh, Zoom or Google Meet. So hopefully you learned something from this video. Um, hopefully if you're a parent watching this, make sure your student gets a chance to watch this. Um, and please feel free to share 
this resource with other parents that you may know. Um, whether or not they attend our school, most of the information is pretty generic. And so I'm hoping that this is a resource for you. Thank you.